No. Welcome to the last, the last workshop in the last day of the last session of the 10, ah, yes. Please, also, everybody remember to use the microphone. Oh, uh, uh, Melissa, could you, I, I need your help for one second. I, you can't talk, you just come here. It, uh, no, I, want, I, I wanted it. I just want you to know that this would all have been completely impossible with a, without the 24-hour marathon for 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 how many? It's 11 day, 11 days straight that Melissa has done, and she keeps saying, "Don't believe her. I have no technical competence." I know it. Yes. She, well, in that case, she has tremendous luck because she solved every single problem that came up and there were many problems. Thank Melissa, you till you make it. <laughs> Melissa Desrochers. You. You're welcome. Okay. <laughs> now, uh, how many of you have a computer with you here or at least an iPhone? Could you, uh, could you tune in to the blog spot for, the, for this? Because, uh, excuse, how should I say this in English or in French? Okay, yeah. Yeah, I have to say it in, Eng in, e in English or in French. Uh, I, the people who don't understand French, I should say that in English, okay. So the people who don't understand French should tune into the blog spot for the translation of Professor Roy's uh, presentation, okay? Uh, on the, it's all, the translation is there and we need it to be, actually I'm gonna somehow have to get it onto the, uh, the video as well because this is, going to be used internationally, but so we'll, we'll take it. So the first speaker for tonight, who has already uh, uh, been here before, is Professor Alan Roy, who is a professor of law at University of um, Montreal. He used to be a professor of child law. He is now a professor of child and animal law because of his child. It's not an exaggeration, it's Camille Roy. Uh, who converted her father. He, he protests and he says, I always had the, 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 the same tendencies that there was no, frame, no legal framework to do it, et cetera, et cetera. But the fact is the legal framework came, but the influence of his daughter came after that. So uh, I, I, th I think when you applaud Professor Roy, you should, you're applauding him and his daughter. So uh, I, I cede the floor to Professor Alain Roy. Merci, euh, Étienne. C'est un grand plaisir pour moi d'être ici aujourd'hui pour euh, présenter un dossier particulier qui, euh, d'une certaine manière, euh, constitue le premier véritable test de la nouvelle loi sur le bien-être et la sécurité de l'animal, loi qui a été adoptée par l'Assemblée nationale du Québec en décembre 2015, loi communément appelée « loi Bessa ». Comme Étienne l'a mentionné, for English speakers, you can follow my presentation with the translation that uh, Professor Arnad has put online. Loi Bessa, donc, qui m'a amené à monter un cours d'éthique et de droit animalier à la Faculté de droit de l'Université de Montréal, où euh, j'enseigne le droit de l'enfant et le droit de la famille depuis 1999. Je m'intéresse au droit animalier depuis euh, plusieurs années. Mais pour justifier un cours en droit, ça prend quand même un minimum de contenu juridique. Et euh, avant décembre 2015, disons que cette exigence n'était pas rencontrée. Décembre 2015, donc, adoption, entrée en vigueur de la loi Bessa. Toujours intéressant de citer les paroles du ministre Pierre Paradis, qui a parrainé l'adoption de cette loi, pour se mettre en contexte. Au moment de l'adoption de la loi, le ministre Paradis a déclaré haut et fort que la loi faisait faire au Québec un bond de 200 ans en avant en matière de bien-être animal. Et à la lumière des dispositions qu'on retrouve dans la loi Bessa, on ne peut que lui donner raison. Fondamentalement, la loi établit un nouveau paradigme social et juridique en redéfinissant l'animal. L'animal ne sera plus un bien meuble. Plusieurs l'ont d'ailleurs mentionné ici même depuis le début de l'école d'été. On va devoir maintenant le concevoir comme un être sensible 
qui a des impératifs biologiques, c'est-à-dire des besoins essentiels, besoins essentiels qui doivent, bien sûr, être respectés. L'animal n'est donc plus une simple ressource qu'on peut exploiter comme bon nous semble. Dans le respect de cette reconceptualisation, la nouvelle loi interdit les abus ou les mauvais traitements pouvant affecter la santé des êtres animaux. Et vous remarquez que j'ai bien dit « pouvant ». Voyez l'élément de risque, l'élément de potentialité qui est le critère de la loi. Un élément de potentialité que certains semblent avoir de la difficulté à appréhender. Pour démontrer l'infraction, il n'est pas nécessaire de prouver la blessure, de prouver l'atteinte à la santé, pour autant qu'on prouve le risque d'atteinte à la santé. La loi interdit également les actions ou les omissions qui expose les êtres animaux à de la détresse. Maître Morello, dans sa présentation, va discuter plus amplement des dispositions de la loi. Exception notoire à l'application de la loi, les animaux d'élevage, d'expérimentation, de recherche et d'enseignement sont soustraits aux protections légales. On en déduit que le législateur considère que l'usage auquel sont destinés ces animaux est nécessaire à l'espèce humaine et justifie donc l'exclusion. On pourrait parler très longuement du critère de nécessité qui est devenu bien relatif en 2018. Mis à part l'expérimentation à des fins médicales, on peut fort bien survivre en 2018 sans consommer d'animaux ou de produits animaux. Plusieurs végans ici qui en sont la preuve vivante. Alors, sous réserve de cette exception, changement de paradigme, que nous dicte l'évolution des réalités, l'évolution des mœurs à laquelle le législateur fait d'ailleurs écho dans le préambule de la loi Bessa. Ce ne sont pas toutes les lois qui sont munies d'un préambule. On a pris la peine ici d'y aller d'un certain nombre de considérants. On écrit que la condition animale est devenue une préoccupation sociétale et que l'espèce humaine a une responsabilité individuelle et collective de veiller au bien-être et à la sécurité des animaux. Bref, et je pense que vous le comprenez facilement à travers ce que je viens de mentionner, il y a un avant 2015 et un après 2015. Un bond de 200 ans en avant, comme le disait le ministre Paradis. Est-ce qu'il y a ici des étudiantes et des étudiants en droit? Sans rien enlever aux étudiants, aux étudiantes d'autres disciplines, disons que les étudiants en droit sont particulièrement revendicateurs probablement un trait de leur future profession d'avocat. Dans un cours d'éthique et de droit animalier, euh, il n'a pas fallu beaucoup de temps avant qu'ils réalisent le grand décalage entre les principes de la loi et les réalités, principes donc qui ne résonnaient pas très fort en pratique, notamment en matière d'activité dite de divertissement ou le critère traditionnel de la nécessité derrière lequel on se retranche traditionnellement pour justifier toutes sortes d'utilisations abusives de l'animal, est particulièrement facile, particulièrement simple à déboulonner. Non seulement la nouvelle loi n'a pas semblé provoquer de remise en question d'activités de divertissement qui existaient bien avant 2015, mais, compte de l'ironie, de nouveaux événements ont vu le jour après décembre 2015, sans susciter le moindre questionnement de la part des organisateurs, dont le fameux rodéo urbain que la Ville de Montréal a eu la brillante idée d'organiser pour souligner son 375e anniversaire en 2017. Les étudiants en droit, les étudiantes sont non seulement revendicateurs, mais ils sont aussi très volontaires. Alors, quand je leur ai proposé en mars 2017 un projet de droit appliqué qui prendrait la forme d'une demande d'injonction à l'encontre du rodéo urbain de Montréal sur la base des nouvelles dispositions législatives. Il y en a une vingtaine qui ont déclaré présent et euh, qui ont spontanément embarqué dans le dossier pour documenter bénévolement euh, l'ensemble des éléments qui euh, devaient s'y retrouver. Bénévolement et sans crédit de cours. Alors, je repasse avec vous les étapes du processus une à une. La demande d'injonction est introduite le 24 mai devant la Cour supérieure du Québec. Le rodéo urbain dont on demande l'annulation est prévu du 24 au 27 août dans le Vieux-Port de Montréal. La première journée d'interrogatoire hors cours au bureau euh, des avocats des défendeurs est prévue le 10 juin. 
vous pouvez euh, facilement imaginer la pression qui s'exerce sur euh, les opposants qui euh, doivent rendre des comptes à leurs commanditaires. On peut penser que cette pression-là les a amenés à faire preuve d'ouverture en vue d'un règlement. Visiblement, on jouit d'un très grand rapport de force. Alors, pour nous, c'est l'occasion de déplacer le débat de la sphère judiciaire limitée dans laquelle il est circonscrit vers la sphère sociale et politique et surtout, surtout de l'élargir au-delà du seul rodéo de Montréal, sachant que c'est le Festival Western de Saint-Tite qui en est l'organisateur et qu'à Saint-Tite, on retrouve toutes les activités de rodéo, non seulement les activités de dressage de chevaux et de taureaux qui sont au programme à Montréal, mais également les activités de terrassement de bouvillons et de prise au lasso et ligotage de veaux. Alors, on profite du rapport de force dont on dispose pour négocier une entente, une transaction, établissant un protocole de collecte et d'analyse de données en deux volets interreliés. Transaction qui va être soumise au tribunal à la Cour supérieure pour homologation le 16 juin, histoire d'en consacrer le caractère exécutoire. La démarche judiciaire, vous le constatez, ouvre donc la voie à une démarche de recherche. Bref, de l'université au tribunal et du tribunal à l'université. Premier volet du protocole, j'obtiens un droit d'accès illimité aux installations et aux êtres animaux. Non seulement à Montréal, mais également, et c'est ce qui est fondamental, à saint tite où se trouve le vaisseau amiral. Et pour maximiser les observations, je me réserve le droit de désigner trois observateurs, trois représentants qui vont pouvoir filmer l'ensemble des activités de rodéo à partir de l'angle de leur choix. Conformément à la transaction, je devrais consigner les données, leur analyse dans un rapport, le rapport du demandeur, comme on le désigne dans la transaction, devenu jugement, rapport dont les conclusions devront être soumises à un comité consultatif, à être formé par le MAPAC, le ministère de l'Agriculture, qui est responsable de l'application de la loi Bessa. Et c'est l'objet du deuxième volet du protocole. Le Festival Western de saint tite consent à ma requête de présenter une demande conjointe au MAPAC pour obtenir la mise en place d'un comité paritaire qui va se pencher sur la question des rodéos dans son ensemble. Ici encore, on vise large, sachant qu'il y a au Québec 150 rodéos annuellement, répartis un peu partout sur le territoire de la province. La transaction homologuée par le tribunal prévoit que le comité sera formé de trois représentants, trois personnes représentant le droit animalier, qu'il me reviendra de désigner, trois membres représentant l'industrie du rodéo, qu'il reviendra aux défendeurs de désigner, et deux représentants du MAPAC à être désignés par lui. Mandat du comité en trois items. D'abord, identifier les différentes normes de conduite en matière de bien-être et de sécurité de l'être animal applicable aux activités de rodéo qui se déroulent dans la province de Québec. Alors, quelles sont ces normes de pratique? Quelle euh, en est l'étendue? Quelle en est la portée? Deuxième euh, volet ou deuxième euh, objectif, deuxième item du mandat, évaluer la portée, la suffisance de ces normes eu égard aux lois en vigueur en se référant notamment à la littérature scientifique publiée sur les rodéos et, principalement, en se référant au rapport du demandeur. Et enfin, faire les recommandations au ministre de l'Agriculture, des Pêcheries et de l'Alimentation du Québec, qui jugera pertinente au fin d'assurer le bien-être et la sécurité des êtres animaux au plus tard, un an après sa création. Alors, le MAPAC accepte cette demande conjointe le 19 juillet 2017, et le comité consultatif va formellement débuter ses travaux le 15 août. On peut facilement présumer que si la demande n'avait pas été présentée de façon conjointe, à la suite du processus judiciaire, le MAPAC n'aurait jamais accepté de créer un comité. D'ailleurs, j'avais rencontré les gens du MAPAC avec d'autres militants euh, au mois de janvier, si ma mémoire est bonne, 2017. On leur avait suggéré l'idée de revoir un certain nombre d'activités en fonction des nouveaux paramètres législatifs. Et je dois vous dire que la demande est tombée à plat. Aucun intérêt, aucun enthousiasme à réévaluer des activités qui ont cours au Québec. 
et à, à vérifier si, oui ou non, il se qualifie toujours en vertu des nouvelles règles. À titre de représentant du droit animalier, vous constatez que j'ai désigné des gens extrêmement qualifiés, Docteur Josiane Arbour, professeur Stephen Arnald et maître Nicolas Morello. Chacune de ces personnes a accepté de siéger bénévolement au comité à titre personnel, non pas pour me représenter, mais pour faire valoir le point de vue du droit animalier. Mes opposants, quant à eux, ont choisi de se nommer sur le comité. Du moins en ce qui concerne M. Pascal Lafrenière, qui est le directeur général du Festival Western de saint tite et M. Sylvain Bourgeois, qui est président de Wild Time Productions, le réalisateur des rodéos, qui euh, siège sur le comité avec le médecin vétérinaire qui travaille avec eux au Festival de saint tite le docteur Pierre Tardif. Je reviens au premier volet du protocole. Mes trois observateurs au Rodéo de Montréal et de saint tite ont capté 135 heures d'images continues à partir de trois angles différents des 20 rodéos qui s'y sont déroulés. Ce qui m'a permis de constituer une banque de données unique, très riche. À saint tite mes trois observateurs étaient accompagnés d'un huissier de justice, histoire de leur permettre de faire leur travail le plus efficacement possible et sans entrave. Ressources quand même très coûteuses qui ont été rendues possibles grâce au soutien financier de différents partenaires, particulièrement de la firme de cosmétiques Loche, qui est bien connue pour son engagement en matière d'éthique animale, subvention de 25 000 qui a été euh, obtenue très rapidement et qui a donc permis d'assumer des dépenses capitales pour nous permettre de réaliser le mandat. Au grand désarroi du Festival Western de saint tite mes observateurs n'étaient pas des profanes. Sans doute qu'ils s'imaginaient que le professeur et ses étudiants se rendraient dans les estrades avec leur iPhone. Ce n'est pas tout à fait la réalité à laquelle ils ont été confrontés. Stephen D., Michael Koblinska de l'organisation Shark de Chicago qui sont venus bénévolement nous aider. Shark est l'une des plus grandes organisations anti-rodéo des États-Unis. Troisième observateur et non le moindre, le docteur Konabun, à qui j'ai pu remettre l'intégralité des trois bandes vidéo de 135 heures le 7 novembre pour qu'il en fasse l'analyse, image par image, avec pour mandat d'identifier pour chacune des activités l'ensemble des risques auxquels les êtres animaux utilisés dans les activités de rodéo sont exposés, que ces risques portent sur leur santé physique ou leur santé psychologique, qu'ils soient mineurs ou majeurs. Le docteur Konabon a consacré plus de 360 heures bénévoles à visionner les bandes, image par image, et m'a remis ses analyses de 610 pages au mois de février dernier. Analyses que j'ai consignées dans un rapport le rapport du demandeur que vous retrouvez sur mon site Internet et qui constitue donc le rapport prescrit, envisagé par l'entente homologuée par la Cour supérieure. C'est ce rapport-là que j'ai rendu public en avril dernier qui a été largement couvert par les médias nationaux, qui a certainement contribué à conscientiser la population québécoise sur les nouvelles règles maintenant applicables, la nouvelle définition des animaux contenue dans la loi Bessa. Encore aujourd'hui, un éditorial dans le quotidien Le Soleil aborde le dossier. Le comité a maintenant pour mandat d'étudier les observations et les analyses du docteur Konabun, qui les a d'ailleurs présentées ici même samedi dernier. Bien sûr, le comité a, a le loisir de soumettre les données et les analyses du docteur Konaboun à d'autres experts. Je dois vous dire qu'on a pris un peu d'avance euh, en prenant euh, nous-mêmes euh, la peine d'approcher euh, des experts euh, éthologues, vétérinaires du monde entier. Euh, je vous invite à vous rendre sur euh, mon site Internet, toujours à l'onglet « Dossier Rodéophile » vous verrez les corroborations euh, qu'on a obtenues. Des experts, éthologues, vétérinaires qui disent partager les conclusions du docteur Konaboun. Pendant ce temps, tout ce que le Festival Western de saint tite a pu obtenir, c'est l'étude ou euh, les observations euh, d'une consultante qui entretient des liens d'affaires avec le Stampede de Calgary, Mme Jennifer Woods, qui n'est pas vétérinaire. Après avoir pris connaissance de toutes les études ou euh, analyses qu'il a recrutement obtenir au terme de son mandat, 
il reviendra au comité. Je suis un peu mêlé dans mes euh, diapos, là. Attendez. Voilà. Il reviendra au comité de faire les recommandations au ministre de l'Agriculture, des Pêcheries et de l'Alimentation, je vous l'ai dit tantôt, qui jugera pertinente au fin d'assurer le bien-être et la sécurité des êtres animaux. Un an après sa création, c'est en quelques semaines. Cinq, six semaines, 15 août. Que se passera-t-il après le dépôt du rapport du comité MAPAC? Voici l'article 6 de la transaction homologuée par la Cour. Le Festival Western s'engage à ne pas intenter, à l'encontre du demandeur, c'est-à-dire moi, de réclamation en dommage ou de tout autre type de réclamation de quelque nature que ce soit pour tout dommage ou autre cause d'action qui résulterait directement ou indirectement d'un recours déclaratoire ou un contrôle judiciaire entrepris par le demandeur relativement à la légalité de la tenue des preuves de rodéo et donne quittance complète et finale au demandeur à cette fin et ce, sans admission d'intérêt du demandeur pour intenter un tel recours. En termes clairs, si en bout de processus, le MAPAC ne fait rien, ne pose pas les actes qui s'imposent pour assurer le respect de la loi Bessa, ce qui est tout à fait envisageable. Ne racontons pas d'histoire. Je vous invite à consulter le récent dossier de la presse sur le laxisme dont fait preuve le MAPAC dans l'application de la loi Bessa à l'égard des usines à chiots. Alors, si rien ne se passe, on va retourner devant le tribunal. Comme vous le constatez à l'article 6, j'ai réservé tous mes droits à cet égard dans la transaction. Nous sommes dans un état de droit, il y a un cadre législatif, et ce n'est pas le MAPAC qui est l'ultime décideur, c'est le tribunal. Dans ce contexte, donc, une étape judiciaire supplémentaire est prévisible, et vous allez mieux comprendre la perspective d'ensemble lors de la présentation de Maître Morello, notamment quant à la mission de l'organisme qu'il a fondé, dont il est président, le DAC, Droit animalier Québec. Entre-temps, Vu mon indépendance, j'estime être mon devoir de partager toutes les données qui sont les miennes, de manière à ce que les choses soient vues et sues. D'abord parce que le droit animalier ne doit pas se discuter derrière les portes closes du MAPAC ou de toute autre instance ou comité. Je vous rappelle le préambule de la loi qui indique que le bien-être animal est une responsabilité non seulement collective, mais également individuelle. Et ensuite, parce que je suis un chercheur universitaire et que l'université ne me paie pas pour que je fasse de la recherche clandestine, j'aurais d'ailleurs refusé net de signer toute entente de confidentialité que ce soit. Alors, dans cette perspective, le 4 avril dernier, j'ai diffusé un clip sur les réseaux sociaux, dans les médias, sur la base des faits saillants rapportés par le docteur Konabou, un clip qui a fait l'objet de plus de 275 000 visionnements. Des images très fortes qui, euh, contrairement à ce que mes opposants ont prétendu, sont euh, tout à fait euh, représentatives euh, de l'ensemble des images captées. Vous pourrez vous-même le déduire euh, ou euh, en conclure en consultant le rapport de 600 pages du Dr Konabun sur mon site Internet, les autres vidéos faisayant qui s'y trouvent. Alors, voici donc le clip. Oups. Il y a un petit piton en bas, c'est ça? présentateur. Le son. Il devrait partir. Ah, merci. Merci beaucoup.
Je m'en voudrais de quitter euh, cette tribune sans remercier deux personnes exceptionnelles. D'abord, euh, le docteur Jean-Jacques Kounaboun. Sa contribution dans le dossier Rodéo est inestimable. L'analyse fine qu'il a faite des données brutes que je lui ai remises nous a permis de faire un bond de géant, nous a permis de voir, de constater des abus qu'on n'aurait jamais pu voir autrement. Je vous signale que tout ce travail d'observation sur des centaines d'heures a été entièrement bénévole. Docteur Konaboun, je vous l'ai dit déjà plusieurs fois, vous êtes mon héros. Je tiens aussi à remercier un autre de mes héros, le professeur Stephen Arnad, qui a, a vaillamment organisé l'école d'été sur la cognition animale qui prend fin aujourd'hui. Des journées d'intenses rencontres, conférences, ateliers, panels qui ont réuni les grands experts internationaux, toutes disciplines confondues. Le travail du professeur Arnaud est d'autant plus méritoire, d'autant plus remarquable qu'il l'a mené en parallèle avec sa participation active dans le comité paritaire, où je l'ai nommé au mois d'août 2017. Merci. There will be a there will be a question session after uh, uh, Metro Morello speaks now, and he'll be speaking in English. Thank you for uh, being here in uh, <clears throat> such a large number on a, on a Friday evening at the end of a very intense uh, two-week uh, period. <clears throat> I warn you, there's a lot more on the air, not just the ones you see, but the ones that are watching it online. Yes. So thank you for um, <clears throat> participating online as well. Uh, just to uh, be unequivocal, the images that you just saw were all images from uh, the St. Sit uh, and or Montreal Rodeo. So it's what's happening here in Quebec. It's not what's happening in Ontario or in the United States. Um, <clears throat> just as uh, uh, Professor Roy mentioned, I'd like to first of all thank Lucam and Professor Harnad who have masterfully organized this summer school on animal cognition uh, that ends today. Um, 11 days of forceful meetings, <clears throat> conferences, workshops, panels, <clears throat> uh, where cognitive science, philosophy, ethnics, and law have all intersected. Um, experts from all over the world have been present at the, uh, the conference uh, to allow us to debate and to better understand what the issues are. <clears throat> As laws begin to develop, Uh, regulating animal welfare and the safety of um, animal beings. Uh, Stephen's commitment, his organization for the summer school is all the more remarkable and that his engagement and contribution to the excess of this event took place during a legal challenge of the Montreal Rodeo, which is now extended to the St. Tit Rodeo, <clears throat> which was instigated by Professor Roy uh, last year. This has been a remarkable event, and on behalf of all animal beings, <clears throat> allow me to formally thank you, Professor Harnard, for uh, organizing this uh, wonderful event. That being said, uh, my talk um, will uh, be around the issue of the fate of animal beings in Quebec, um, the new legal paradigm Is the new paradigm, is it promising or is it simply an illusion? Uh, the reason that I've indicated 2015 to 2025, as Professor Roy mentioned, the Loi Bessa came into effect uh, in 2015. So I thought that it would be interesting to look at the past two years and then what will happen over the next, try to predict what may happen over the next eight years for a 10 year, <clears throat> a 10 -year period. Um, so I will try to explain what uh, some of the consequences of future developments in animal law uh, may be 
as they play out in Quebec uh, courts. To answer the question, uh, is this new law uh, really a promising new paradigm and what will it change? I've broken down my talk into four parts. The first part is a quick history of um, how we got to where we are. The second part is a general framework, a discussion of the general framework of the new law. Third of all, I want to talk to you a little bit about how courts actually work. Because it's fine to have a law, but you have to go to court. And to go to court, you have to understand uh, how the court system works with respect to animal beings. And last, I'd like to talk about how does an animal being get their case into court in light of this new, this new law. Thank you. Just a little bit about terminology. As Professor Roy mentioned, the Quebec Animal Welfare and Safety Act is, or la loi sur le bien-être et la sécurité de l'animal is generally referred to as la loi BESA. And so during the presentation, I will use the French term as it is generally accepted in Quebec. And I want to juxtapose the, uh, the term human being with animal being. You heard Professor Roy use the term animal being. Uh, the purpose behind animal being, this was a term that was coined by uh, uh, Le Dac in order to put emphasis on the fact that um, animals are actual beings and to try to dissociate the former term of animals with animal beings to make a distinction. When we use the term animal or beast or bête uh, en français, these terms are generally used and they're devoid of any mention of a soul that belongs to the animal, animal being. And so the term animal tends to reference simple objects. Uh, they reduce the animal to being an instrument for use, to be at the service of a person, for example, objects for entertainment, and more frequently objects of, of, uh, uh, to consume for consumption. So we use the term animal being to describe the new legal framework in terms of a continuum of living beings, which may include plants, animal beings, which includes formerly what we called animals, and human beings. And we, we tend to conceptualize the relationship, not in terms of a horizontal hierarchy of relationships, but in terms of an interconnectivity between the living beings, the animal beings, and the human beings. A little bit of, a little bit of history uh, about our historical relationships between human beings and, uh, and animal beings. Animal beings have not always in history been treated uh, devoid of any soul or the capacity to, uh, to reason or to not feel. In fact, uh, there were trials uh, during the Middle Ages in France in the 15th and the 16th century where people would complain about the damage of, of uh, various animals, as they were called then, uh, or, or beasts. Uh, when these animals would go into uh, the farm and they would destroy um, the, the farmland or the crops, uh, trials actually took place where they were deemed to have the capacity to judge right from wrong and therefore they could be held civilly liable. And what's interesting is that a judge would actually designate a tutor for the animal being and they would present the animal's defense and there would be a judgment that would be, that would be rendered. I highlight this simply to demonstrate very quickly that through history, animals, as they were called then, have not consistently been treated or handled as property. We come back to Quebec, 1807 is the uh, Napoleonic Code. So as you may know, this was legislation that was acted in, enacted in the 19th century that the French bourgeoisie uh, used to advance their interests, primarily in terms of private property, estate law, and for inheritance. And it included three books in the Napoleonic Code, the Book of Persons, the Book of Property, and Acquisition of Property. 
And where did animals, as they were known, get classified? They were classified in the book of property. 1866, just before the Confederation, uh, the Civil Code of Lower Canada came into effect. Lower Canada was Quebec, Upper Canada was Ontario at the time. And animals were classified based on the Napoleonic Code as movable property. What this meant is that owners exercised a nearly absolute power over their property. What that meant is that they could injure, harm, or completely destroy their property, and it was entirely legal because these animals, as they were called, were property. This is an interesting fact specific to Quebec. Uh, it was in fact very difficult to even try to find the English translation for agriculturalism, but that's the translation, agriculturism. Uh, you may know that this was uh, uh, in the 19th century, a Christian-based ideology in Quebec that consisted of a form of stable constitution of various forms of domination. Uh, the Catholic religion, the dogma coupled with the legal classification of animals as they were known as movable property were a part of this movement. And this led to animals being used as instruments because they were uh, property. This all changed in December 2015. There were two new laws which came into effect as uh, Professor Roy mentioned. Uh, there are two pieces to the puzzle, the Civil Code of Quebec and La Loi Bessa. What the Civil Code of Quebec is, it's uh, what we refer to as le droit commun or the equivalent of common law or the basic law uh, of the state. Um, I'll refer to it simply as the law of the land. It's the general law of the land that applies. At the same time, the legislator uh, put into effect La Loi Bessa, uh, which is the Animal Welfare and, uh, and Safety Act. And we'll talk about uh, the impact that that has had. What the legislator did was when they changed the status of animals to animal beings in December of 2005, they described um, uh, animals specifically saying they are not things. And they say that they are sentient beings and they have biological needs. So when the civil code was amended to say that animals are not things, that removes them from the status of being property. Now that might seem like a, a <clears throat> no large event, but it's absolutely fundamental. It, as uh, Professor Roy mentioned, it breaks with 400 years of tradition in Quebec of treating animals or beasts simply as property. So there are four new legal cornerstones to the, the new law. First of all, that animals are not beings. Second of all, that they're sentient. Third, that they're actual beings, that they live in a state of being, which a rock does not, and property does not, is not in a state of being, and they have biological needs. So the, the basic tenets of the new legal paradigm are sentience, beings, and biological needs. I'm going to talk to you about the biological needs because it's absolutely fundamental in the law. What are the biological needs? In French, they're referred to as these imperatifs biologiques. The biological needs are three, physical, physiological, and behavioral. So as a jurist and a lawyer, not as a cognitive scientist, I will use the following definitions as references to these three biological needs. When we talk about physical needs of animal beings, we're generally referring to the body itself, to the body's condition. So this means, for instance, hair, bones, muscles, organs, the physical aspects of the species. So to give you an example of a physical biological need in the law, a runner over time builds muscle. That is a, that is a physical characteristic, and that is part of what the law is capturing under biological needs of animals when we talk about physical biological needs. When we talk about physiological, that's not a synonym. It's a different, it has a different meaning. 
and physiological refers to the body's healthy or normal functioning. It refers to how the body and its parts actually function. For instance, the ability of a mammal to transfer oxygen from lungs to muscle. So if we look at the example that I gave in terms of a physical biological need of the runner who over time builds muscle, uh, in the case of a runner who over time practices their sport, if she increases her capacity to transfer oxygen because she becomes more efficient at this, this is a physiological need uh, uh, as uh, distinct from the physical. Behavioral is a lot easier to understand. Behavioral refers to the way animal beings act, their conduct, their manners, their responses to stimulation, or environment or responses to a feeling. So I'd just like to show you quickly what the actual legal definition is because it's quite encompassing. Uh, biological needs means the basic physical, physiological and behavioral needs, which I've just talked about. And now listen carefully, related to such factors as the animal's species, race, age, stage of growth, size, level of physical or physiological activity, social ability with humans and other animals, cognitive abilities, which is the purpose of this, of this conference, and state of health and those related to the animal's capacity to adapt to the cold or heat or to bad weather. You can see that the legislator clearly, when talking about these three biological needs, has unequivocally described an animal being as not being property. In the law, there are also five fundamental freedoms that are universally acknowledged uh, that are now enshrined in the law. Uh, as you know, there's the freedom from hunger or thirst, freedom from discomfort, freedom from pain, injury, or disease, freedom to express normal behavior, and freedom from fear and distress. I've indicated in brackets the various sections of the Loi Bessa uh, that entrenches these principles in the law. Uh, if we look at, uh, I won't comment on hunger or thirst, I think that that's uh, quite, quite evident, but if you talk about freedom from discomfort, uh, this refers to, for instance, providing an appropriate environment, including shelter and a comfortable or resting area. If we talk about pain, injury, or disease, this refers to prevention or rapid diagnosis and treatment. We talk about uh, to express most normal behavior. This would include things such as sufficient space, proper facility, and the company of animal beings own kind. And finally, freedom from fear and distress uh, generally refers to ensuring conditions and treatment which would avoid mental suffering. <coughs> Professor Roy talked about some of the exceptions under the Loi Bessa and their are uh, three that are, are particularly important. There are several, but I'll, I'll comment on three of them. First of all, the Loi Bessa exclu excludes factory farming and it excludes in scientific uh, experimentation. It also excludes non-captive wildlife living in Quebec, which falls under an entirely separate law. What it does apply to are domestic animals such as cats, dogs, rabbits, cattle, horses, pigs, sheep, goats, chickens, and their hybrids. It refers to companion animals that are domestic or wild animal beings um, living with a human. And it refers also specifically to red foxes and American mink in captivity. This is what I call uh, the four rabbits and the four different results. Uh, this is a, a screenshot of a page at DAC Point Quebec, and you'll see that there are four images. The first image says domestic, the second image says um, factory farming, the third image is wildlife, and the fourth is exotic. The way that the legal structure, the Loi Bessa, interacts with other various pieces of legislation is, um, is somewhat complex. If you have a rabbit that lives in your home, the rabbit living in your home comes under the first, the first uh, picture of a domestic 
animal being. And if the rabbit is living with you in your home, the rabbit is protected with a relatively robust legal structure under la loi Bessa in terms of um, uh, ensuring that it's, it's um, physical, physiological, and behavioral needs are met. If we take the exact same rabbit, nothing has changed. And the rabbit moves into the second image of industrial farming. There is an exclusion, as I mentioned, under the law. So the exact same rabbit essentially has no protection for its biological needs, for the fact that it's sentient and the fact that it's a being. <clears throat> if we take the exact same rabbit that's living in a forest, and there are many rabbits that live in forests in Quebec, then it is uh, a, a separate law uh, that, that um, deals with how that rabbit will be dealt with. And under a specific piece of legislation, that rabbit can be hunted and can be legally killed. Whereas if that exact same rabbit was under the first image of a domestic animal being living in your home, it would be illegal to hunt the rabbit or have somebody hunt your rabbit. And last of all, our exotic animal beings, which fall under a separate regime. And so if the rabbit comes from outside Quebec, it will typically be qualified as exotic and its protection and the legal regime that, that um, applies to it is separate from la loi Bessa. So what is interesting about this is that Animal beings were, their status was changed from property to becoming sentient beings. But depending on notably the relationship that they have with us, if they're a companion animal, there's, there's a lot of protection. If they are the subject of factory farming, there's an exception and little protection. If the rabbit is living in the wild, it can be hunted legally and killed. And if it's exotic, there's a separate uh, regime that, uh, that applies. This is not the first time that the legislator has taken this approach. If we look at human rights uh, legislation and development, uh, we've done the same thing with our species. Children had one legal regime. Women had a separate uh, legal regime. Sexual orientation was a separate uh, legal uh, regime. Uh, uh, people of color had a separate legal regime. At some point we decided no, that whether you were um, a child or an adult, whether you were a woman or whether you were a person of color, uh, all of these members of the same species should enjoy the same rights and freedoms. The loa Besa creates these categories of, uh, of animal beings. I'm going to just quickly talk about entertainment for human beings because uh, Professor Roy uh, mentioned this. And what's important to note is the law doesn't make an exception for entertainment or sports. And the law doesn't take into account economic spin-offs from entertainment or sports. Um, I'm going to show you just very quickly what's known as the chevaux plongeurs, diving horses. Uh, in 1905 in Colorado, uh, they would take these animal beings they would have a basin that would be four meters deep and be about 12 meters high. They would use electric prods and false doors to force the horses to jump. This was an activity for entertainment for human, human beings. This did not only happen in the United States, it happened, it was also a form of uh, human entertainment in Toronto in, 19, uh, in 1907, here you see the horses jumping. Oftentimes they would have a, a, a person on the back of the horse at the, uh, at the same time. The point here is that there is a question, and uh, Professor Wah referred to this, of social acceptability in terms of how we interact with our animal uh, beings. Obviously this kind of entertainment would be illegal today under la loi Bessa. What's interesting is to look at, when we talk about sports and entertainment, and we talk about la loi Bessa, um, I'd like to give you the example of the Cirque du Soleil. Uh, 
which everyone I'm sure uh, knows. Uh, Guy La Liberté is the founder of Cirque du Soleil. He was a street performer. And uh, in 1984, he experimented to try to reinvent the animal circus. In other words, to reinvent the business model of exploiting animal beings in order to make money. So he created what's called a proper circus. And what's interesting is that the circus is based on theatrical and a character-driven approach. And as a result, there's an absence of performing animals as it remains today. There are some, there are some exceptions because I've learned that there were snakes and doves that were used 10 and 15 uh, years ago. But what is interesting here is that in contrast to the rodeo that uh, Professor Loi talked about, in light of the, the uh, Loi Bessa, there's a great amount of resistance of people that use animal beings for entertainment or for sports to change the business model to fit the law. We see this also in uh, the city of Montreal, which has draft regulations uh, with respect to animal beings um, that uh, can only be sold from shelters in, uh, in pet shops. And there will be mounting opposition by pet shop owners, I would expect. We have a horse-drawn carriage industry in, uh, in Montreal where it is well known if you live in Quebec, uh, numerous cases of horses um, uh, being subjected to uh, very extreme stressful conditions. And yet, despite that we have La Loi Bessa, the people that um, have an interest in this industry simply refuse. They, they just will not adapt their business model to the new law. This is somewhat, this is somewhat um, surprising because when you run a business and the law changes, you have to change your business model to adapt to the law. So when employment equity for women came into effect, uh, many years ago, there was a necessity for business owners to look at each job and to analyze the contribution that women were making and was it equivalent to the contribution that went, men were making. Businesses simply didn't say, I refuse to accept employment equity and I'm not going to, I'm not going to evaluate my, uh, the jobs that I have. When we talk about animal beings, there is a great amount of resistance to adapt to the new, uh, the new law, La Loi Bessa. I want to talk about going to court because I've, 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 I've talked a little bit about La Loi Bessa, uh, about there being uh, sentient beings um, with biological needs, which are physical, physiological, and behavioral. But that doesn't help us if we can't get to court. So I don't know if you've ever been to court. You don't have to, to say if you, if you have or haven't. The point here is that la loi Bessa has changed. The court system hasn't changed. And the way that the court system works is that one person wins and one person loses because it's an adversarial system. And so when you go to court, if you are, are contemplating um, trying to advance animal law, generally speaking, you need to develop a legal theory around your case. That's the first point. So you have to have some basis under la loi Bessa to develop the theory. Second of all, your theory of case has to be more probable than your adversary. So the judge is going to look at what your theory is and what, the, what your adversary's theory is, and then they will, the judge will make a finding which is more probable, probable being the key word. And also, the legal arguments and facts are based on rules of evidence. Now, this may seem unimportant, but it's extremely important because there are two basic rules of evidence. One is the admissibility of proof, and the second is the, is the probative value of proof. What that means is that um, if you are advocating to try to make legal change using the uh, La Loi Bessa, you have to get into the court record various facts. And your opponent is going to do everything that they can 
to avoid getting having those facts adduced into the court record. Once the facts are in the record, the judge has to weigh what those facts mean from a legal, uh, a legal point of view. This is important because the legislator under La Loi Bessa has created a special evidentiary rule, which is called a legal presumption. I, I'll explain to you what that means and then we can look at section five of the law. An example of a legal presumption, typically if um, an employer, for instance, fires an employee, the employee who sues the employer must be able to demonstrate that they were fired for uh, without just cause. And they have to convince the judge at 51% or more that their, their position is more probable than the position advanced by the employer. That's the general rule. In particular cases, for instance, in the case of a pregnant woman, there are many jurisdictions, including in Quebec, where the pregnant woman simply has to demonstrate that she was pregnant at the time that she was fired. And then the burden of proof shifts over to the employer and the employer has to demonstrate because there is a legal presumption now for the judge that the woman was fired because she was pregnant. That's, that, that facilitates her case immensely. Then the employer has to try to muster a defense to say, no, it's not because she was pregnant, it's because she was non-performing, she was insubordinate, uh, et cetera. So you see the importance of a legal presumption. It facilitates litigating a matter in a very important way. So if we look at section five, uh, it says the owner or custodian of an animal must ensure that the animal's welfare and safety are not compromised. That's pretty easy to understand. Then we go on to say an animal's welfare or safety is presumed to be compromised if the animal does not receive the care that is consistent with its biological needs, physical, physiological, and behavioral. This is particularly important and we see it in pieces of legislation like child welfare, youth protection, um, uh, people that are particularly vulnerable where the legislator creates this rule to facilitate litigating a particular matter and the Quebec government has opted for this choice. So this is a, this is a promising evidentiary rule uh, that's, uh, that's important in, in Quebec. What that means is that there, I predict that there will be enhanced animal protection welfare in all of the predictable areas. This will include uh, things such as having adequate water and food, protection from, from heat or cold, uh, care when injured, ill or suffering, the prohibition of abuse, mistreatment, they may affect the animal being's health. Again, Professor Roy re referred to this. Death or serious harm, not being subject to acute pain, extreme anxiety or suffering, you'll note the use of the adjectives <coughs> acute and extreme, uh, animal being adoptions, and uh, animal being uh, uh, entertainment. Now, what's important under the, the La Loi Bessa is that there is a provision in the law that allows the legislator to create regulations. Regulations are a legally binding method uh, that the courts must consider when, uh, when examining a, a, an issue before the court. And there are two ways that regulations can be made, and this is important because we don't know how the legislator will, will, will regulate uh, animal being welfare and safety. One of the ways that they can do so is what is called a prescriptive regulation, and the second is called a descriptive regulation. I'll give you an example of what, of what that means. If, for instance, the legislator says, okay, it's not sufficient in the law to simply talk about adequate water and food, I want to have a regulation to be able to be more specific what those words mean. So they enact a regulation. If they use the prescriptive method, the legislator could say, for instance, that every dog must be fed 50 grams of food for every two kilograms of weight. 
That would be known as a prescriptive regulation. It's very specific. And so it's easy to prove or to disprove if you've complied with, with that legal requirement. A descriptive regulation, the legislator could simply say that animal beings must be provided with adequate food, taking into account their race, their age, their stage of growth, and their, and their physical activity. When the regulation is descriptive, it doesn't say how you, how you, it doesn't say what um, measures you must under, undertake to comply. It says that you must comply with very general criteria. Now, why this is important is because if we try to predict what will happen in the upcoming years, it's important how the Quebec government will regulate. Will they choose the descriptive or the prescriptive method? <coughs> their advantages and disadvantages to uh, to to each. When we talk about these traditional areas of welfare, the question that I also ask myself is, will the legislator enact regulations that will elaborate on the balance of what are called affirmative duties or obligations of care that you have towards, for instance, your dog or a companion uh, animal being? These are positive obligations. Or will the legislator take a, a, a different approach and put more emphasis on prohibited or negative obligations, that is things that you are not allowed to do? So we don't know because there is only one general set of regulations with respect to cats and dogs. There is another regulation that is being examined with respect to exotic animal beings. And as a result of uh, Professor Roy's um, initiative with rodeos, there may be another set of regulations that will come out. So the question is, how will the legislator actually regulate? The law will go beyond just the traditional um, aspects of animal welfare. I'll try to give you some uh, general examples of how it will infiltrate its way into the general law of the land, or le droit commun. For instance, provincial acts and municipal bylaws will be impacted by la loi Bessa. There is currently a bill before the Quebec legislature to ban um, uh, specific races, uh, 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 races of, of dogs. And under that act, it specifically says that despite, despite the loi Bessa, we're going to uh, put into effect a separate law. So we can see that the legislator is concerned with the general framework of well-being and safety for, for animal beings. And if they want to, for instance, put into effect ban specific, uh, a breed specific legislation, they have to take into account la loi Bessa. The city of Montreal, which is uh, uh, coming out with uh, new uh, regulations for um, for animal control, again, uh, when they're developing their regulations, they, they will likely take into, into account la loi Bessa. Family law, one, one, one easy example. Typically, in the case of a divorce or separation with young children and a dog, what happens? Dogs were, were considered property, and so many times judges would simply say, the dog will follow the young children just like any other piece of property. Because we are now talking about sentient beings with biological needs, there will be arguments that will be developed to say, no, this isn't in, this doesn't comply with the biological needs of the dog that they simply follow the children uh, for a whole, bunch of, uh, whole bunch of reasons. Those kinds of arguments uh, will begin to make their way through the courts. Estate law and wills, if an animal is simply property, you leave the property to whoever you want. And if you were to inherit a dog under the former regime, you could do what you wanted with the dog. You could feed the dog, you could abuse the dog, you could leave the dog out to the dog, you could kill the dog. Because we now have a legal regime that says that, that, that uh, we have sentient beings with biological needs, this will impact how wills and estates will be settled because it will become legally difficult to simply say, this is property and you can leave the property to whomever you want. So for instance, in my personal case, I have uh, developed a, 
uh, a special clause uh, with my estate attorney that um, I have forbidden uh, the people that I have um, entrusted my dogs to, to euthanize them. So that would be much more difficult to do under the former regime, but I'm confident that that, that would be enforceable in court. Uh, landlord tenant law and condominium law. Um, as you know, there are a large number of, um, uh, of uh, rental properties that prohibit companion animals. Uh, this is something that may be challenged under the loi Bessa as we begin to um, apply the principle that this is not just a piece of property that you're bringing onto the premises like a fridge or a stove uh, or a fireplace. Uh, condominium law, in most declarations of co-property, there are um, obligations that if the uh, animal being is causing a disturbance, there's usually a clause, uh, a damage clause that says that you'll have to pay $100 a day for each day that the animal being is there until the animal is removed. Those kinds of clauses uh, may be subject to review by a court. Uh, issues around wrongful death, for instance, of a companion animal. This is not just a piece of property that is killed by a, by a neighbor. Um, the law is relatively clear that you will be able to seek moral damages now. Not only did I lose uh, my companion, but I've suffered morally as a result of this. It's not just a piece of property um, that's, uh, that's, that no longer exists. Labor and employment law. Um, in many cases, uh, if you are in a unionized work environment um, and there's no specific clause in the collective agreement and your companion animal dies, it may be very difficult for you to not go to work on that day if you're not able to work. You could be subject to disciplinary measures. Under la loi Bessa, that kind of disciplinary measure by an employer um, uh, can be examined. Contract law. Uh, there was a recent case where a person entrusted their dog to a kennel. Um, the, uh, the dog got out of the kennel and unfortunately um, died. Uh, and the, the, the judge reasoned that this is not just property. If you go to the cleaners and you, and you give your shirt or your blouse to the cleaners and when you go to pick it up and it's not there, well, what happens? You're reimbursed for the cost of your blouse or of your, uh, of your shirt, nothing more. Um, but the, and, and that's the same legal reasoning that would have been applied before La Loi Bessa, but the court rejected that, saying that these are sentient beings and these are not pieces of, of property. And the type of contract and the damages that arise from the kind of contract as a result of La Loi Bessa uh, uh, have been modified by the, by the courts. Transportation law. Uh, transportation companies, rail and air, are looking at how animal beings are currently being uh, transported. In La Presse, there was a, a recent article, Du Mordant, mais peu de résultats, um, which I've translated as has teeth, but few results. That was uh, this week. And in that article, it cited uh, some interesting statistics uh, from 2017 to 2018 inspections by the uh, um, Society for Protection of Animals and Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. Um, you'll see on the right-hand column, the Ministry of Agriculture, who's responsible for applying the law. And you can see that um, the animal shelters, uh, the number of complaints that they, uh, that they received uh, and that they handled was larger than the number of the Ministry of Agriculture. But other than that, the Minister of Agriculture um, handled a greater number of, of inspections, a greater number of non-compliance notices, a greater number of uh, condemnations and seizures of, uh, of animals. Now, why am I speaking about the contrast between um, animal shelters and the Ministry of Agriculture with the uh, La Loi Bessa is because there's a dilemma. And the dilemma is the government's application of the law. It would appear that the government is relatively active when we look at these statistics, in fact, more active than, than animal shelters. But if you um, work within the area of uh, animal law, animal welfare, um, there are 
many critics that talk about inadequate government training by the government employees and deficient government financing in order to enforce uh, la loi Bessa. So there are two legal challenges that, uh, uh, with respect to um, animal beings. We have a relatively good law. Uh, the general consensus from the jurists that I've heard over the past two weeks was that the law is relatively adequate. But there are two, there are two uh, questions. The first is the question of proof. As, as a lawyer, I can do nothing if I have no proof. So the question becomes, where do I get proof? Uh, Professor Roy was absolutely instrumental in obtaining 135 hours of video to, uh, to examine, to look at the proof with respect to the, the law. This is a daily challenge for, for trial lawyers. Where do I get my proof? But what's more important under la loi Bessa and um, is it promising or is this just an illusion, is the enforcement. And the enforcement of the law can be done in one of two ways, actually concurrently, by public means through the government, through the Ministry of Agriculture, or by private means, notably by a nonprofit group or by the initiative uh, of a university professor, as in the case of, uh, of uh, Maitre Roy. Here are some examples of nonprofit emblematic legis uh, litigation. Emblematic litigation in French is called le litige stratégique. And what this means is it's using the courts to achieve social change. And so la loi Bessa can be used um, to ensure that the, that the law will not be restricted <coughs> to simply the notion of avoidable pain. Um, Emblematic litigation can, can center around the integration of harm to be defined as setting back biological interests and needs. It can be used, emblematic litigation, for the right to report abuse or mistreatment by a person, which I call the black hole syndrome. Now, the problem here is that La Loi Bessa has two reporting mechanisms. One is there a mandatory uh, mechanism for, um, notably for veterinarians, that in the case of mistreatment, or abuse must report to the government. But as a citizen, you can report any uh, mistreatment or abuse that you believe in good faith has occurred and that you've witnessed. Uh, the number is uh, 844 uh, animo. Uh, you can go on site as well. The problem here is that if you file a complaint or you report, there is virtually no way for you to know what happens with your report. So this is why I call it the black hole syndrome. Uh, emblematic litigation can be used to try to enforce the right of citizens to find out what has actually transpired with complaints that they have filed. And one last example of emblematic uh, lit litigation is factory farming. I've used the term adverse differential treatment. That is a term uh, that centers around discrimination under federal uh, um, uh, legislation. Uh, there are 45 million animal beings per year in Quebec that are subject to animal, uh, animal farming. And emblematic litigation uh, may be instituted to try to um, contextualize the exception in the Loi Bessa for factory uh, farming. Nonprofit litigation, what that means is not going through the government, but going through a nonprofit organization means that the courts are going to be challenged to interpret the new law. And what the nonprofit litigation through emblematic litigation means is that we can, uh, we meaning jurists uh, uh, in Quebec and outside Quebec, can test what are the legal, the legal indicators of sentience. What's the threshold of evidence that's necessary to actually establish sentience? How will the three biological needs be applied? How will the legal presumption of compromise that I mentioned, how will that be interpreted? That is in the law. Does the cautionary principle apply? That is not specifically in the law, but emblematic um, litigation uh, can litigate this matter to um, try to convince a court that the precautionary principle is an implicit obligation that must be considered? And finally, does the proportionality principle apply? 
The law makes no reference to proportionality. So if you have a thousand minks being abused, is that any different from one mink being abused? And should the court um, have a different, uh, a different legal, legal test? Now, these issues that I have outlined under nonprofit litigation, I would anticipate that the government would not normally litigate. And so this is why it's important that nonprofits um, uh, become involved in, uh, in, this, uh, in this issue. So in terms of a new paradigm, the question is, is, is the animal being a subject or an object of law? And what this very simply means is that every human being has their own has their own rights. So we say that as human beings, we're subjects of law, but things have no rights. So we say that they're objects. So when we try to look into the future and, and to predict how will la loi Bessa be interpreted, will the courts interpret it to say that animal beings are closer to being subjects of law or having certain rights, or will the courts interpret the law to say that uh, essentially, uh, even though animal beings are not things, uh, that, they are, that they are objects of the law. We don't know the answer to that question yet. That has to do with legislative uh, intent. Defense of interest by third parties. So we have, a, we have a, a relatively good piece of legislation, but how do you get to court? Uh, interests of animal beings may be defended by third parties due to the inability, obviously, for animal beings to sue. Um, it may be legitimate for animal beings to represent the interests of human beings. And if a wrong is done, we may be able to petition the court for the respect of the animal being's right. This is important because under the BESA, la loi BESA, it's the Ministry of Agriculture who's responsible for the application of the law. Uh, but in terms of emblematic litigation, these are issues that can be raised and that can be litigated and um, debated in court. If the government's not acting, can a citizen or can a nonprofit organization uh, take up the, the, the cause? Opponents, adversaries to legal change. Uh, when I talk about the law of the state, these are just some of the arguments that I anticipate, though I could write several pages. Adversaries will plead there's no acute pain, there's no extreme anxiety or suffering. Again, if you look at the adjectives, they, they, they will say there's pain, there's anxiety and suffering, but it's not acute and it's certainly not extreme. Opponents will invoke the reversibility of mistreatment or abuse. Uh, I would expect that uh, uh, arguments will be raised around animal beings uh, are non-reporting. Cognitive science is unclear. Uh, arguments around living property will be invoked. That is that this is simply living property. It's still property, even though the law says that these are not things. Uh, the benefit of the doubt around sentience, opponents will argue that it should be given to the owner or the custodian and not to the animal being. There will also be arguments uh, around a cost-benefit analysis. I've mentioned that economic spin-offs are not a consideration of the law. That does not mean that those arguments will not be presented in court, uh, notably loss of employment in uh, various uh, cities or regions. Um, there's a very interesting um, argument, abusive interpretation, uh, which is not a legal term, which was a term that was um, uh, invented and used uh, during the rodeo debate where many of the proponents of the rodeo uh, advanced this idea that uh, the interpretation that was being given when you see the video that this is an abusive interpretation of the law. And there will also be the, 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 the argument where, where will it stop? There's this, there's this argument, this thinking that okay, uh, one day it's dogs, it's cats. The next day you won't be able to fly. You won't be able to uh, use a frisbee with your dog in a park. There's all kinds of arguments to say that this will, uh, this is untenable uh, to uh, actually give effect to the to uh, to the law. So the government of Quebec, as uh, Professor Roy mentioned, is the first level of decision makers. And what can they do? Uh, they have several things. First of all, they can close the file. 
if there's a, a complaint that's been made, they can say there's no abuse, there's, there, there's no mistreatment. They can regulate an activity. I talked about that, how that can be done. For instance, they can regulate all rodeos in Quebec. They create, uh, create standards or codes of mandatory practice that have the same effect as regulations, so they're binding uh, on the courts and on citizens. They can restrict activities by geographical regions. They can also exempt a person, species, or breed from the law. And they can completely ban an activity. So this is what the government can, uh, can do under la, la Loi Bessa. There are many um, uh, options that they, they have. But the ultimate decision maker, again mentioned by the, the law professor, is that the decision made by the MAPAC can be uh, legally challenged uh, in court. Um, not only can the government's decision be legally challenged in court, but as the Professor Roy has indicated, um, another entity can be sued as well uh, under, under this uh, act. We believe that that's possible. And it's possible to seek redress or correct the application or the incorrect application of the law by the government. This is important because it's not an illusion. It is a real ability to go, to complain, to debate in an adversarial process about uh, the government's interpretation of its own legislation or its um, decision not to enforce its legislation. So in conclusion, we have two pieces of legislation. We have la, the, 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 the civil code, uh, which is the law of the land. We have la loi Bessa. And what's important to note is that in la loi Bessa, it enacts the moral consideration principle. What that means is that if you have a sentient being, that is a being that feels, a being that experiences, a being that has physical, physiological, and behavioral um, uh, um, needs, you must morally consider how you are interacting with that animal being. The new law, uh, we see with the new law, the emergence of this moral consideration uh, principle, but the law is also one of public policy, d'ordre public. What that means is that it is a law which is not simply, um, that, that all individuals must comply with. So this is my last, uh, my last slide. So animal beings are no longer uh, property, so what's next? Well, we have the entrenchment of the moral value of animal beings in the law, which requires considering their welfare, their security, the respect of their essential needs as sentient beings. Animal beings are covered by la loi Bessa, and this is my conclusion, you may disagree with it, uh, we can talk about it, but animal beings are no longer excluded from our society. They are now a part of it. And that is a fundamental change in terms of how we interact and how we see animal, uh, animal beings. So the new legal paradigm will be tested, will be challenged. In response to the question that I asked, is this promising or is this just an illusion, this new legal paradigm? I do not believe it's an illusion. I believe that it's promising. We can meet in eight years from now to review uh, developments, legal developments, uh, but I believe that the legal structure is there. Animals are not things, as the civil code says, and um, uh, I believe that there is a real opportunity to advance animal law uh, in, in Quebec. Thank you. Okay, um, we're going to open it up to questions. Let me just say a couple of preparatory things. First of all, uh, occasionally, Metro Morello talked about the race of dogs, but then he corrected himself. He, what he meant was breed. In English, we don't say race. And the, but, but the one that I, I'm curious about is when you talk about the soul of uh, the animal, uh, what on earth are you talking about? If you, if you look at the, the um, general parameters of the, uh, of the law, the law talks about uh, uh, various concepts uh, such as um, the psychological well-being of, uh, of an animal, 
um, a social en enrichment, the ability to interact with other species uh, that are the same species. Um, it's, it's a metaphor when I talk about the soul because it elevates and it changes the notion, the conceptualization of animal beings from simply things to beings that exist and that have um, biological needs, which as I've mentioned, are behavioral as well as physiological uh, and, and physical. And so when I use the term uh, soul, it is to try to to um, elicit the fact that being is a state. The legislator has talked about uh, psychological well-being, anxiety, distress, and those elements re relate to the soul or the being of the of the animal being. Um, in this particular company, if you talk about soul, you, uh, you uh, reveal yourself to be a dualist. I strongly recommend not speaking about soul when you're speaking to scientists. I have no idea what it means to uh, judges, but it's really bad news with scientists. It, it, a soul is normally thought of as a, normally, is thought of as an immaterial, immortal substance, you know, going to heaven and things like that. I don't think when you're trying to defend sentient beings, it's a good idea to marry a notion like that. Yeah, I'm, I'm not referring to Descartes or the, or the distinction between uh, physical uh, and the dualist concept that you're referring to. It's, it's really an idea. It's not, a, it's not a legal concept that's in the law. It's to say that when we talk about the moral consideration, uh, it means taking care. And, and, and it's just a general sense, but I take note of your, of your point. We heard um, Alana Devine and Sophie uh, Gaillard, are they here? Uh, speak a couple of nights ago. And a quick summary is that uh, they asked, is the law protecting animals? And the, and the answer was no. They gave some very glaring examples of how even in the presence of the new law, animals were not being protected. So simply declaring them to be sentient beings with biological needs so far hasn't been enough. It seems to me that the case of Professor Roy is the one that's really going to test whether, there's, whether, this, uh, whether this law means anything at all. Other countries have adopted sentient being language, but it hasn't led to anything. We've had prof uh, um, uh, Stephen Wise here proposing another approach, which is to uh, look for, use habeas corpus to, uh, to, uh, to um, claim um, personhood status for animals. It's another approach. Quebec is different in the sense that it's, in, it's been for the long time the worst, the worst, it's still in, its, in what it's doing, it's the worst in Canada still. That's what Alana and, and Sophie said. But for the 400 year history that you mentioned, it's been the worst by any standard. And now with this law, which is not the personhood approach, but the, the ascent, it, it has a chance of becoming the best. It has a chance of being the first location where this kind of thing is actually put into practice and not just as words. So I invite uh, Professor Roy and, and, and uh, uh, Nicholas Barella to tell, tell us how these actions can do that. And you can do it in French and I'll yes. do the translation. I think you understand you know, that uh, it's important for me to speak speak French because we're here in Quebec, in a French university, so it's a question of principle for me. Um, but do it in phrases that I can translate. Ouais. On a une définition de l'animal qui n'est pas que cosmétique à mon avis. Euh, je trouve ça dommage qu'on dise que la loi euh, n'est pas, pas adéquate à la lumière des expériences passées, à la lumière par exemple du reportage euh, qu'on a lu dans la presse, c'est dans l'application de la loi qui a un problème. So the question pas, is, is this just a cosmetic law or is there, or does it mean something? And, it's, and the problem is in the application of the law. The words are just words. 
Euh, avec une définition comme celle-là, on peut faire beaucoup de millages pour autant qu'on réussisse à convaincre un juge audacieux. Euh, la démarche de M. Wise aux États-Unis s'inscrit dans une perspective de « common law ». L'ABS corpus euh, peut être plaidé euh, dans la mesure où on n'a pas les limites textuelles en « common law » que ce que nous, on a. L'ABS corpus s'applique ici aux personnes et la notion de personnalité juridique est assez bien définie par les chartes. Euh, mais si le professeur Wise cherche, euh, par exemple, à faire libérer euh, des grands singes euh, en les assimilant à des personnes, compte tenu de leur capacité cognitive, euh, nous, on peut certainement considérer qu'il n'est pas conforme aux impératifs euh, biologiques des so. grands singes d'être détenus. Euh, et donc, euh, cette détention pourrait être considérée illégale à la lumière de la nouvelle définition et des nouveaux devoirs. Uh, that's, uh, I'm going to uh, encapsulate that because that's an original thought and it's, and it's an, a good one. The difference between the habeas corpus approach and the uh, sentient being with, with biological needs partly resides in the fact that uh, that's, uh, the U.S. is a common law jurisdiction. And so uh, they're not, they're, they're, they make their law on the fly by taking a case to court and if... And if, and if um, uh, um, Stephen Wise manages to get a favorable verdict for his plea for personhood for chimpanzees, then in a sense the law has been changed. We are in a, in a Napoleonic Code jurisdiction at, where we have a principle, which is that animals, uh, animals are um, sentient beings with biological imperatives. And Professor Roy believes, and I think, I think there's some uh, potential for that, that this same principle of biological needs can be used to do the same work that state, personhood status is doing under, under a common law. Did, did I do a faithful translation? Perfect. Okay. So uh, now let's open up the questions to you. Um, ask the, because, because of the, the uh, online version, even if you're a francophone and Professor Roy is francophone, ask your question in English so that the people there will know what's being asked, and then we'll translate the answer if it comes in French rather than in English. <laughs> Uh, to both of you, but uh, Nicola Morello, you at the end you you, you showed a list of counter arguments uh, in the favor of uh, of the of the cases in uh, for animals. So I was wondering, with these counter arguments that are that could be um, argued in the case of the rodeo uh, file, do you are you positive about that? And do you think that if um, you win the rodeo case, do you think that rodeo will become illegal or is it really, should we have the common law to be able to do that? Was it clear enough? <laughs> uh, well, bring it close, bring the mic very close. With respect uh, to the, the rodeo, I'll comment on that in a, uh, in, in a moment or, or uh, Professor Roy. Um, but this is entirely new legislation And there's nothing particularly um, new about the fact that when there is new legislation, it takes many years before um, uh, different decisions by judges are um, become settled law, which we which which we refer to as settled law. So, for instance, if you look at the whole question of human rights legislation and the duty to accommodate. That debate has been going on for about 10 years, perhaps 15 years in Quebec, and the law is still not settled on that. So it can be a very long, uh, a very long process. What, what is important, I think, is, is at this point not the result, but it is, it is getting into court to be able to solicit a decision from a judge. And the point that uh, Professor Harnard has raised when we talk about the loi Bessa as being not effective, there are two ways to enforce the, the law. Through the government and, and, and through public means or through emblematic litigation, which was really the initiative of Professor uh, Roy. And that I believe is, is more hopeful in terms of generating uh, results. Because 
the emblematic or strategic litigation is not based on, um, on government interests, which many times um, are competing or in a, in a conflict of interest. It's simply advancing a legal principle that's in the law and seeking a decision from, from a judge. And if that decision is incorrect, then it will go to the Court of Appeal, which is three or five judges, and the Court of Appeal will, will decide what the issue is. So when I say that it's promising, it allows jurists who are interested in these issues to go to court and to argue, which was absolutely impossible to do before 2015. With respect to the rodeo, I'll... Hmm. Uh, avez raison de parler d'action de, 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 symbolique ou plutôt d'action stratégique. Uh, dans la demande d'injonction, uh, et je pense que Maître Morello l'a bien exposé dans sa, dans sa présentation, um, le demandeur doit faire la preuve de son intérêt. Ça prend un intérêt juridique pour rester en justice. Um, il y a tout un système de plaintes qui est prévu dans la loi Bessa, un peu comme pour la loi sur la protection de la jeunesse. Si vous voyez un abus, vous allez faire un signalement, vous n'allez pas poursuivre vous-même l'abuseur. Euh, dans la loi Bessa, si vous voyez un abus qui est commis à l'égard d'un animal, vous contactez le MAPAC, vous faites un signalement au MAPAC et c'est le MAPAC qui sollicite l'application de la loi, qui saisit le tribunal pour éventuellement poursuivre le contrevenant. Let me, let me just do a little translation. By the way, I'm not a lawyer. Is, is uh, interest and standing the same? <laughs> interest. But yes, but when you talk about standing, is it the same thing? Because that what, came what, up what, with... Yeah, well, I think what Professor Roy is explaining is that uh, in the case of an injunction, uh, there is a necessity to prove legal standing. Legal standing meaning that you have the right to go and to complain to a judge because not just anybody can file uh, um, a, a lawsuit. There are criteria that allow you to... Uh, to file a lawsuit. So one of the issues is is legal standing. Okay, so so and in the case of the injunction, that was the case. Uh, Professor Roy and his 20 students, are any of the students here that were part of this? Chloe. Okay, good. Chloe, hi. Mm -hmm. um, they, they, uh, they, I think Professor Roy used the fact that he was a Montrealer <laughs> to, uh, is it? Oui. Uh, c'est un peu uh, tiré par les cheveux, peut-être. Uh, c'est la Société des Fêtes qui organise le rodéo. Société des Fêtes, c'est une parapublique. Donc, ce sont nos taxes. Je suis un Montréalais. Donc, mon intérêt pouvait passer par cette idée de contribuable. Uh, remarquez que j'aurais pas pu faire ça à Saint-Titre directement oui. parce que je suis pas un citoyen de Saint-Titre. Je paye pas de taxes à Saint-Titre. C'est une entreprise privée. Donc, l'idée d'attaquer le rodéo de Montréal était, était bien choisie. Est-ce que ça aurait convaincu le juge? Ça, c'est une autre histoire. Alors, quand on parle de litige stratégique, peu importe l'issue euh, du procès, en amont, je vous parlais tantôt de la pression exercée sur les organisateurs. L'événement a lieu au mois d'août. On est au mois de juin. Les commanditaires commencent à s'énerver. Ils commencent à dire qu'ils ne veulent pas être associés à, à une injonction. En tout cas, c'est ce qu'on peut présumer. Euh, de sorte que les opposants ont... ont ont vivement intérêt à, à faire preuve d'ouverture et à régler là, ce qui a permis le protocole, ce qui a permis l'entente. So you can't you can't tell whether it, that would have worked to say I'm a Montreal taxpayer and I that's why I object to this rodeo. We don't know, but it produced enough of an effect that the rodeo was was worried about its sponsors and whether they, they whether they lose uh, business and as a consequence they were inclined to make a deal. And that was how this remarkable, and it, I, I can't say how many, in how many words the deal that came out of it, how remarkable it was. That's what resulted in, the, in three observers at the Rodeo and, and a, a 610-page report and 135 hours worth of data that are going to be mined for the next two years. Sorry, I'm saying too much. You should be saying these things. <laughs> À la meilleure, en fait, dans la meilleure des hypothèses, pour moi, c'est pas la meilleure des hypothèses. La meilleure des hypothèses, c'est ce qui s'est produit, c'est le protocole. Mais disons qu'il n'y a pas eu cette entente-là euh, et que j'avais gagné l'interlocutoire. Euh, l'interlocutoire au jugement avait effet à Montréal. That's right. If he had won, the Montreal Rodeo would have been cancelled, but that would have been it. And because of this agreement, the entire the, pro the provider of the rodeo, uh, Saint, uh, Festival Western de, de Saint-Tite, uh, and its 
Saint-Saint-Saint-Saint Saint rodeos were covered in this with many more events. Et les 149 autres rodeos du Québec. 149 other Quebec rodeos. Now before the next I uh, sorry. Mireille can uh, let's ask Mireille who always asks good questions to ask a question and then I'll introduce Dr. Herman. Okay, thank you very much. First of all, thank you for an excellent presentation, uh, thoughtful, thorough, and I can say that I don't recall having been uplifted by a presentation on this topic before. So congratulations. It, it gives me hope. Um, I had a question regarding the mention in the civil code that animals are not things. Uh, right under that statement, there was a little fine print that said that um, any section of the act concerning property would nevertheless apply. Uh, if you could please elaborate on that, and also, if, if it's stated like that in the civil code, does it preclude challenging the various laws that you, you suggested could be challenged, like transportation law and so on? Bring it my, close to you. My, my interpretation is that um, when the legislator broke the 400-year tradition of Uh, animal beings being property. The, the legal dilemma was how do you introduce this into the civil code? For instance, in the family law reform, if I'm not mistaken, uh, it took about 25 years of study to change the, the, the family law rules. So it seems quite easy to make a change in, this, in the civil code, but there are 3,000 articles and it's very complex to, uh, to, to make a change because it has a cascading effect throughout the, throughout the code. So what the legislator did was they said that uh, animals are not things, uh, but then they go on to say that um, uh, the dispositions with respect to property nevertheless apply. Now, my interpretation of that, and I'll give you an, ex uh, an example, um, If I, if I have a dog, for instance, a companion animal, I, as the custodian or owner of that, of that animal being, must comply with its, with its biological needs, which are physical, physiological, and behavioral. If you were to try to take the dog from me because you liked the dog, then I would rely on that disposition that says that Uh, the rules of property apply because it's the only way that I can assert my right of ownership over the, over the dog. So that does not mean that because I am the custodian or owner of the dog that the dog should be treated <coughs> as property or living property. It simply means that there is a necessity of having a legislative support to be able to define these legal relationships that, uh, that exist. So when you go to adopt um, uh, an animal being from uh, a pet shop, for instance, again, there has to be some legislative support. What, what are you doing? Are you buying? Are you leasing? Um, what is the exact transaction? So that, se that separate section under, this, under the civil code allows to define the legal relationship that's being formed. But once you understand what the legal relationship is, um, it is my, um, my interpretation that you must continue to rely on the, la loi Bessa and the biological needs of the, uh, of the animal. You can simply not say, well, it's still property. Um. Je pense que Maître Morel a tout à fait raison en, en disant que le législateur s'est pas donné la peine de créer un droit animalier complet. Euh, dommage qu'il ait pas au moins amorcé l'œuvre. Euh, dans d'autres juridictions, euh, ils ont quand même eu l'audace d'aller plus loin que l'affirmation très réductrice euh, du législateur québécois 898.1 alinéa 2 en Suisse, par exemple. Dans chacune des sections du Code, ils ont adopté une disposition spécifique lorsque euh, il y avait euh, intérêt à le faire, par exemple en matière de séparation conjugale, euh, dans le code suisse, dans le code autrichien, dans le code allemand. Euh, on dit, en cas de rupture, 
l'animal doit être confié au conjoint qui représente le meilleur intérêt pour lui. Bref, c'est le critère de l'intérêt de l'enfant appliqué à l'animal de compagnie. Euh, en cas de décès euh, du maître, il est possible de léguer des argents, des sommes à son animal. Ici, ce n'est pas possible parce qu'on ne peut pas léguer des biens à un bien euh, au sens du Code civil, compte tenu du renvoi que le législateur fait au livre du droit des biens. Euh, Là-bas, on présume que le legs fait au chien, au chat, euh, est présumé à être fait à charge d'en prendre soin. Et donc, le legs est valide. Euh, Maître Morello donne un exemple, et là, on diverge d'avis. Euh, pour lui, la définition, la nouvelle définition de la loi permettra à un juge, au moment du divorce, de confier l'animal euh, non pas au propriétaire, mais euh, à celui qui est peut-être plus en mesure d'assumer ses impératifs biologiques. Moi, j'ai plutôt l'impression, compte tenu de la linéa 2, que c'est la facture qui triomphe. Je suis propriétaire, même si je reste dans un 1,5 à Montréal, euh, c'est moi qui ai le titre de propriété, donc je peux revendiquer ce chien-là, même si ma conjointe reste en banlieue avec les enfants, avec accès au parc. Sauf que moi, ça ne me soustrait pas à la loi Bessa. Donc, j'ai l'obligation euh, de prouver éventuellement que j'assume, que je remplis, que je satisfais les impératifs. Et si je ne le fais pas, bien, il y a tout un mécanisme qui va prendre le relais. C'est-à-dire quelqu'un pourra faire une plainte au MAPAC, puis le MAPAC pourra faire enquête, puis éventuellement pourra me retirer le chien. Mais, mais c'est vraiment deux étapes. Moi, je ne pense pas que l'alinéa 1 permettrait d'outrepasser le détour par la facture, par le titre de propriété. So, put two lawyers in a room and you'll get two opinions. There's not, <laughs> there's not a complete agreement on this, but basically the, the, the issue, I won't summarize all of this, but the issue is that, that uh, although animals remain property in a sense, their interests now play a role. It's not quite, Prof Professor Roy is actually in a good position to talk about this because he's also a specialist in family law. But it's a little bit like the situation in a divorce, uh, and even uh, with, re with respect to children, uh, who, in whose one way of looking at it is because of the biological imperatives, the animal should, should go to the partner who, is, who, who will treat it what, who is in its best interests. And that can be direct, if I understand correctly, that can be a direct effect or else it can be a derived effect. We can, uh, you can let it go to the one who owns it first and then then test whether, it's conform, whether it conforms with their interests. And there's not complete agreement over there. What comes to mind for me, of course, is we shouldn't be talking about owners and properties at all. It should be something like adopters or, or guardians, but uh, that's not what the legislation says. Uh, before, uh, Frédéric, is it a long question or a short one? Because I want to introduce Dr. Herman. <laughs> who's going who's gonna to actually talk? But if it's a short question, you can ask it then. Okay, so uh, Dr. Herman, uh, who's, who's one, one of you, uh, is a veterinarian from Berlin and who's also, she, she, her, her, she's doing a PhD in, at Johns Hopkins University now. Uh, she was shocked by the, the, by, by the presentation by Alana uh, Devine about how, how little effect the laws there have. In, in, in Europe, they don't have the sentient law, but the, the kinds of things that were described as being permitted here were unthinkable to, uh, to uh, Dr. Herman, and I'll let her continue. Okay. Um, yeah, it, it was way more uplifting today because it sounds like there's a lot of possibility. Um, yeah, and uh, so maybe I can just speak about a little bit about Europe or Germany, if this is of interest, because that's what I know best. Um, but you mentioned some things, for example, um, so I was before, like, before I, I work at, um, started working at Johns Hopkins, I was actually a state veterinarian and uh, my area was animal research. So I was supposed to, um, represent animals uh, in court um, if I saw that their, 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 their animal researchers uh, didn't work according to their licenses. Um, and yeah, I, okay, my observations are, first of all, um, we are not properly trained 
as you mentioned also that that's the problem that the the governmental employees are not trained um everybody who went to vet school knows that we don't know how to talk to judges um i was lucky to get to receive some training because there's a foundation um, for lawyers in Germany who specialize in animal welfare law as much as you can specialize, but they, they are interested in it. And so they publish reports um, and they were very helpful for me because I mean, they let me join their club. <laughs> and also when I was in trouble, because um, I mean, I wasn't really in trouble, but when animal researchers decided that they got had enough of me and my letters and my me finding them they sometimes tried to threaten us with their lawyers so then i was very lucky to have this group of lawyers writing reports in my favor i mean i obviously never did anything wrong but it's, it's just a way of threatening in the end and of occupying me with writing back and forth because as you know that takes forever with lawyers <laughs> so so my my experience um from germany is also not great um first of all we, we are not very well trained and second um the judges don't really care for mice and rats for example like they didn't and so it, it was also just um it wasn't a, the criminal law it was just um they did something wrong in terms of the regulation. So it's like if you if you run over a red light with your car, so that was the same court that handles um, animal welfare, um, if you do anything against the animal welfare law. Um, it's only going to be, um, um, uh, how to say that? Um, I uh, know it's it's if you do something real cruel, then it's going to be the criminal criminal law. But this, I never saw that happen in in my field. And actually, what happened uh, in my area in animal research, because the judges didn't understand, and they I think they don't even read the animal welfare law to be honest. Um, most of the cases were actually dismissed, and that's the the of course the worst message you can send is okay. You just have to. If you get fined by the competent authority for doing something wrong uh, while conducting animal research, you just have to take a lawyer, go to court, the court, and the judge will say, just say this is minor and is going to dismiss. So why were you so shocked about Quebec? Um, because in terms of animal transport, for example, it's not like it's it's better in Germany. So I, when you're a veterinarian or a vet student, you actually have to be in a slaughterhouse for four weeks during your training. Um, of course, it depends also on the slaughterhouse and the single veterinarian, but we have in every slaughterhouse, there are veterinarians who are employed by the state, so they're kind of independent, and they do uh, physical exams when the animals arrive. And when, if we had seen um, frozen animals and, 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 and animals with amputated legs, uh, we could like this would have been penalized, um, so that's why I was so shocked. Il uh, y a un élément dont on n'a pas parlé au Québec qui est particulièrement problématique. Je sais pas comment ça se passe en, en Europe. Uh, le bien-être animal sera pas protégé au Québec tant et aussi longtemps que il relèvera du MAPAC. Le MAPAC est en conflit de rôle. Le rôle du MAPAC ou la première mission du MAPAC, c'est de protéger l'agriculture, c'est de faire la promotion de l'agriculture. Et l'agriculture conçoit l'animal comme une ressource et non pas comme un être sensible. Alors, tant et aussi longtemps qu'on n'aura pas un ministère qui se consacre indépendamment des questions d'agriculture au bien-être animal, on va rester dans la théorie. Kat, do, Kat, do you want to translate that because uh, pr uh, Metro Morello and I are not allowed? Are we? Well, well Professor Roy talked about, uh, in his opinion, the Minister of Agriculture is in a direct conflict of interest because the primary role of the Ministry of Agriculture is to promote agriculture, which sees... And cash. Which, which sees as essentially animal beings for um, uh, uh, for economic uh, gain. And because there is a direct conflict of interest, um, the uh, the Quebec ministry um, 
cannot fulfill its its role under the uh, under la loi bessa and and this if i've translated uh, correctly this illustrates the point of why i feel so strongly about emblematic litigation mm -hmm. because there is no conflict of uh, of interest it is simply a group of citizens that finance with um, uh, with jurists and uh, litigate these uh, these matters and when you are involved in emblematic litigation or strategic litigation, you are the person that frames the questions. You are the person that adduces facts into the record. You are the person that gets to argue the points. It's not, it's not the, uh, the government or, the, or uh, Le MAPAC. And so what is interesting and what is promising is that this new law opens up this ability to engage in emblematic uh, litigation. Uh, we also talked about some of the obstacles around legal standing, but there, there are judgments uh, from the Supreme Court of Canada that are very encouraging, that would appear to open the door for a nonprofit or for an individual to engage in this kind of litigation, because like an environmental law, animal beings can't litigate these matters them, uh, themselves. And so ultimately this will rely, this will depend on the motivation of uh, Quebecois citizens to um, become involved in these cases, to finance these cases and to move, uh, to move forward. Um, there was a question about the, um, the, the, the judges. Um, you know, we have, a, we have a system where uh, typically the case would be heard by one judge. If that decision is not correct, it would move to the next court of appeal, which would be heard typically by three or sometimes five judges. So there is, there is a system of, of, uh, uh, of, of revision. Um, so, you know, I'm, I conclude on the note that I'm, I'm more hopeful than um, pessimistic. Et ce qui est intéressant avec le protocole mis en place, c'est que faire la démonstration de l'intérêt juridique qui qualifie devant le tribunal me semble beaucoup plus simple à l'autre bout du processus qu'en matière d'injonction. En matière d'injonction, comme je vous le dis, ma qualité de Montréalais, de contribuable, de payeur de taxes, c'est pas un recours en injonction qui va être introduit dans la mesure où le MAPAC fait pas son travail à la suite du dépôt du rapport du comité. C'est plutôt une action en contrôle judiciaire. Contrôle judiciaire, c'est que les règlements doivent être conformes aux législations. Alors, attaquer une décision gouvernementale, c'est-à-dire un règlement comme étant non conforme, c'est une action qu'un citoyen, un justiciable, peut faire valoir facilement, l'intérêt juridique ne devrait pas être une côte aussi haute à monter qu'en matière d'injonction. Big difference between the problem of standing in doing a, trying to do an injunction against the Rodale, and now that the evidence is in, it's going to a committee in MAPAC, and if, the, if Professor Roy's view is that MAPAC is not doing the right thing, then he can go before a tribunal and there's no issue of standing at all under the new law. Well, I think I, th I think the issue of standing will constantly be uh, uh, raised by opponents because it is the easiest way to prevent a party from pleading their case. So it will it will always uh, be raised at least uh, initially. Um, I think what uh, Professor Roy has mentioned is important. If you look at, for instance, the question of of um, horse carriages in Montreal, la loi Bessa means that if the Um, the governing body, whether it is MAPAC or whether it's municipal government, does not enforce their regulations, this new piece of legislation um, allows for a legal challenge in the absence of the government uh, acting. And that is what is so encouraging because if there is social intolerance for animal suffering, injury and death, and citizens uh, mobilize, these social issues can be litigated and can become judgments which force the owners of these activities to comply with a court order because it's rendered against them uh, personally. Correct me if, it's, if, it's, if I'm wrong, but I think it's even stronger than that. Did I understand correctly that uh, if you agreed in the agreement 
never to try to get an injunction against a rodeo again, then they wouldn't challenge your standing if you took them to court. Did I? Uh, no, no, they specifically said that they reserve the right to challenge uh, legal standing. Still. Yes. Ouais. Et, et, disons que euh, ils ne me poursuivront pas en dommage ce oh, okay, qu'ils faisaient yeah, yeah, yeah. ce qu'ils faisaient pour l'injonction voulait me tenir responsable l'ensemble des pertes que un gain euh, me procurerait euh, ou leur ferait subir alors là j'ai une quittance totale et complète pour les dommages mais il renonce pas okay. euh, à contester mon intérêt juridique But, parce que comme maître Morello le dit c'est simple hein, ils peuvent faire tomber la poursuite au stade de l'intérêt mais disons que ils ont une position pas mal moins forte dans le cadre d'un contrôle judiciaire que dans le cadre d'une injonction That's right so my mistake was I thought that they renounced the standing challenge non, that's not it, but, they, but they did renounce something that, that that's also is important they're not going to claim damages uh, they they wanted a bond of uh, is that is that public uh, Dans le cadre de la demande d'injonction, ils m'ont demandé un cautionnement de 100 000. bond. Ce qui était insensé, il n'aurait jamais eu, mais on, on voit que c'est la même perspective qu'une poursuite Bayon. Donc, on, so on a 100 000 bogus, parce qu'on veut te faire... Uh, it was a bogus call for, for... It's the usual kind of slap, slap thing, where they, they asked for a lot of money, which they would have lost in the end, but it, was, it would have been enough to prevent the injunction. Mais... But, mais, mais C'était extrêmement intéressant, cette demande-là, à un autre niveau que financier, ça démontrait la panique, ça démontrait le pouvoir de force qui était le nôtre. Parce que quand on est rendu à, à vouloir casser une poursuite par une approche Bayon, c'est parce qu'on craint. On yeah. craint. It, was, it showed that there was fear. They wouldn't have done a slap, a slap attempt if they weren't already worried that, that there was, there, there was some, something to worry about. Can I just ask? Yes, please. Just one last question, because it, it sounds so promising to have the strategic uh, litigation, litigations. And so what, like, um, what can people from Quebec do to help? And what's your capacity? Like, how many, like, how many cases could you start? You can give money. <laughs> ah, yeah, that's <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you have to promote you, this. I think you, people. You can communicate yeah. with uh, Professor Roy. You can <laughs> communicate uh, with uh, with uh, le, le DAC. Uh, it's it's really a question of um, of understanding that there is a tool that was inexistent before. It's a tool that needs to be used and needs to be uh, challenged. We believe that it's not. Uh, I believe that this is not just um, an illusion that social change will take will take place. It will benefit animal beings. We're seeing part of the effect through uh, Professor Roy's uh, strategic uh, litigation, 135 hours of documented, unrestricted access to a rodeo is quite, re is quite remarkable. And so that is the kind of steps that, uh, that will be taking, that will take place. But these actions need to be financed. They need to be financed and uh, they need to be uh, involved with all kinds of volunteers that are interested in these, in these issues. With that, most of you are scientists, so uh, your contribution can be to, con to con pursue the themes of this Summer Institute, which are, which are centered on the notion of sentience in non-human beings. And with that, I thank you for, the, for your attendance at the Summer School.